minutes long. Uh, you will be kicked or dragged off the stage if you exceed the time. Uh, there will unfortunately be no time for questions because we have so many talks. Um, so without further ado, let's start with Harshal, um, who is going to talk about tweetstormy.com. Oh, and I have a couple of other announcements to make, just quickly. Um, there is a talk in the banquet hall downstairs uh, by Arpita about sleep in the brain uh, at 1745. Um, there's also an ongoing off-the-record talk, uh, which is about AWS cost optimization, uh, which has already started from 5 p.m., but if you want to catch the end of that, it's happening. Um, uh, one last minute thing. Ah, yes. The first shuttle for the party venue leaves at 6.10 p.m. Uh, people should gather near the registration desk. Shuttles will leave every 20 minutes. The party is at Brewski Pub. You must wear your badge to have access to the party. You must not lose your badge because you will need it again tomorrow to get back in the conference venue here. Okay. Yep. O over to you, Harshal. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so you might have seen me from the morning. I was a volunteer. What am I doing up here? Uh, let me warn you, it's not related to DevOps at all. So I'm a drug addict. Okay, now that I have your attention, that drug is Twitter. And uh, like most of the audience here, I think uh, this is a relevant audience. Uh, so I've been working on a very little, very, very little side project. Okay. So, uh, if you are a pro Twitter user, which I think this is a relevant audience for, I think you might have seen a lot of threads on Twitter. Those are called tweet storms, and like uh, a lot of famous internet things, they were. Uh, invented or the term was coined by uh, Mark Anderson of uh, Netscape and uh, you might have heard of his uh, VC firm. Um, so you, I'll show you a few famous tweet storms. This was one by a guy called Siddharth about uh, sexism, but not in the way you would expect. Uh, there are other famous uh, Tweet storms as well. MKBHD, a famous tech reviewer, just goes on rants and here's another by Dan Abramov. He's a open source contributor. So I'll show you what I mean. You just, uh, right now, like, it's not publicly accessible. And the logic doesn't work. Um, so I'm looking for beta testers. That's why I'm here. Uh, you type here, and instead of uh, manually uh, sending a tweet and then replying to it, you can see the tweets in advance. Like, maybe uh, when the logic is more advanced, uh, after 140 characters or before we, uh, you can break, so that each uh, tweet in itself is coherent. And preview the tweets. We'll have a good mobile view as well. It, won't, it will be a completely free project, just like for learning. And uh, so I'm a computer science student. And uh, you might have heard of the principle of l the principle of least power. Everything that can be made in JavaScript will eventually be made in JavaScript. So I was like fascinated. Let me learn Angular. That sounds fancy. And let me learn Koa. I already knew Express. So I dove in, made the front end. Um, I was like very tired. Oh, what is this, all this 
Angular shit. Then I decided to go with Express itself because I didn't have the patience to learn anything else. So that's it. We'll be launching very soon. If you are a pro Twitter user and uh, would be interested in this kind of thing, please uh, go and join the waitlist or email me, find me. The contact info is there in the footer. And sorry for putting you through this blatant advertisement. Thanks. Okay, our next talk is going to be Docker on ARM uh, by Suraj Nawad. Is he here, Suraj? No? Okay, we skip that one. If he shows up later, maybe. Uh, then in that case, we'll go to the next one in the talk funnel, uh, which was identifying anomalies using graphite functions by Aditya. Aha. Just sign the disclaimer. <laughs> Hi. So, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, the way we are using uh, graphite in uh, to figure out uh, how to expose metrics and uh, basically find out when things are going wrong uh, in a way that you don't need a developer to understand what is going wrong. Now, to give you some background, uh, I work at Capillary Technologies. Uh, we uh, have some services or some integrations with a lot of external vendors for a lot of various things. We also run a lot of uh, services in-house. So, uh, we do have a few modules which require to integrate with uh, maybe 20, 30, 40 services externally or internally. Now, at any point of time, uh, we would uh, like to figure out if these services are running fine or not running fine. Now the first part, like many of the talks I've already talked about, is that uh, collecting the data. So we started doing that and uh, we started using the Coda Hill library and Graphite on top of that to get our metrics. We quickly ran into a scenario wherein we were exposing upwards of 800 or 900 metrics for a couple of modules to basically find out how the system is running. Now, we drilled down, we tried our best, we got it down to something like 200. Now, if you have something like 50 services running and you want to find out the health of each service and some which are there of the module itself, uh, you would require a couple of metrics for each module in particular. So, we were still looking at upwards of 100 metrics which needed to be monitored on a regular basis to find out if things are working fine or not working fine. So, uh, obviously, someone who doesn't really have insight into the system can't really make sense of that. So, we tried using uh, graphite functions to make sense of what is happening. Now, uh, I, I'm not sure if everyone here has used graphite functions, but uh, it's, it's a little cryptic to start off with, but uh, you can uh, basically uh, write regular expressions to get all your series of a specific type to show up on one dashboard. We ended up having dashboards with upwards of 50 graphs, which doesn't make sense to anyone. So then you start off uh, applying functions on top of this to start making sense of it. Now, one of uh, the basic things that we tried doing was um, you apply something called as a, a maximum above or an average above function. Now, uh, what would you want out of something like that? You would basically say, I have 50 graphs running over here, uh, out of which if any of the services that I'm interacting with, let's say it takes a time of more than a second or two to respond, I would like to have those services show up on my graph. So that 
uh, when something goes wrong, I just look at the graph. I have one or two or three services showing up on the graph and I know exactly where the things are going wrong as opposed to looking through 50 and if you go through the legend of 50 items, it is basically uh, incoherent. And if you are like me who is basically colorblind, it's very, very difficult to find the difference between the shades of all those 50 graphs. So you apply something like a maximum above or an average above graph and you bring that down to two or three or four graphs, which is very, very easy to understand. So now assuming you want to take this the next step, uh, you typically would apply statistical means to or a machine learning algorithm on top of your graphs to find out if things are working fine or not working fine. Now going by the typical mathematical approach, uh, you could uh, apply some statistics on top of it. Uh, one of the ways that people do this is uh, applying exponential smoothing functions. Graphite by default gives you the functionality of something called as a whole twinters aberration. Now, let's say you apply that on a time series data that you are getting. Basically what this does is it looks over the data that you have over the last certain amount of time. Uh, it finds out the possible deviation that you might have in that data which is acceptable. You can set how strict or lenient you want this to be. And um, whenever the deviation exceeds these limits, you see a spike. This in combination with your max above, max below graphs basically give you pointers to find out exactly when something is going wrong and where it is going wrong. So now we are in a position wherein we just uh, tell certain people, some uh, particular team to just look at these graphs. If anything shows up on the graph, you basically raise an alert. So that's how we solved a lot of our monitoring issues. Thank you very much. <laughs> very closely at the time. Okay. Test, test. Our next, hello. Our next speaker is Rahul Menon. Uh, Rahul Menon is speaking on self-driving Kubernetes. Hi, uh, my name is Rahul. I work with RazorPay. So I'm just going to take about three minutes of your time uh, just to tell you about what self-driving Kubernetes is. Uh, it's basically running Kubernetes in Kubernetes. Uh, I see a lot of value in it, mainly because, uh, as you saw the demo this morning, you can actually scale out your Kubernetes cluster just by executing one single command. And it helps with uh, deployment, upgrading, scaling, uh, a lot of things. So uh, I've been trying to work on this for the last three months or so, uh, trying to get this, uh, you know, thing working and out into production. I've still not succeeded, but I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. So, <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry, mm. I lost my train of thought. Uh, so, uh, if you have uh, been following up uh, with the Kubernetes community, this is a, a project in the Kubernetes incubator called Bootcube. Uh, so, this essentially what it does is it brings up a temporary Kubernetes server, an API server, uh, a scheduler, and a controller manager, which then tells your kubelet to actually spin up your uh, API server, your controller manager, uh, even your etcd cluster, you can actually host the etcd cluster which your Kubernetes server stores things on uh, in Kubernetes. And uh, people behind this has obviously been uh, CoreOS. Uh, I've been trying to uh, follow with the project maintainer uh, and trying to get uh, get bugs sorted out. And uh, uh, as from the demo this morning, if you actually wanted to upgrade your Kubernetes cluster, you could actually do a live edit like uh, shown this morning change the version and apply it. It's that simple. It would go down your API server. If, when upgrading the API server, you get a minute or two, uh, I'm sorry, a second or two of where uh, your API server does not respond, but it's back and your cluster is functional and it just works. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much what I had to say. Uh, anybody who wants to talk about it, you can find me outside. Yes, I do have a blog post. Yes. 
Sure. I will, we can talk after as well. Ping, ping. Ah, our next speaker will be uh, Juber, uh, giving a digital transformation. Is he here? No? Okay, he transformed himself out of the venue. Uh, so then it's Dananjay uh, uh, with a cloud for robots. Okay, guys, uh, this is sort of continuing of the work we did at ETH back in 2013, and which was presented at PyCon. And back then, Docker didn't exist. So we set out to build our own cloud platform using Linux containers and Twisted. And as you may imagine, it was quite a mess. We managed to scale to about 50 nodes. And that was sort of the end of it. We went back to our research and our jobs. Then we decided to take another shot at it at the beginning of last year. And the vision we have is quite simple. Robots, uh, as you see in this slide, were supposed to be a part and parcel of our lives. We all grew up with the Jetsons, and we all grew up to robots surrounding us. And that's really not happened. I mean, this is where robots are. They're in factories, or they clean your floor, or they cost a few million dollars and kill a few people, right? And that's not what we want from robots. Robots, the way I see it, are assistants to our day-to-day -day life, right? But building a robotics company is really, really hard. You need to put together people from so many varied disciplines to get a simple product out. And that's often really hard to do, right? So we want to take an approach similar to smartphones. Think about it. 10 years ago, you had devices that had a bunch of processing power and were connected to the internet. And it was all monolithic. You had just a couple of companies like Nokia and Blackberry. And it was really hard to build a mobile phone. But today, someone sitting in Shenzhen can make a mobile phone because they know how to make great hardware. Uh, someone sitting in a garage can make apps. And all the complexities are handled by a single platform. And that's allowed us to democratize mobile phones. It's created the mobile revolution. We actually think there is some scope to do this for robots. Uh, so in May this year, in fact, in 10 days from now, uh, we're launching the first service powered by our cloud, which is basically autonomous drones and delivery drones uh, that use the power of the cloud to do complex computation, storage, and processing. And as we progress forward, we see this vision uh, in a way that allows us to orthogonalize and federate and commoditize robotics. If you're a guy who knows how to write a great application using JavaScript and knows nothing about robotics applications, algorithms, or hardware, you can still contribute. If you're a person who is an expert in building hardware, you can focus and provide drones as a service. Uh, if you are a person uh, who wants to write crazy algorithms for routing and navigation, uh, well, you could come on board and create routing, navigation, and picking algorithms. Uh, the idea is to sort of open all of this up to as many people as possible. And uh, since this is RootConf uh, going into the tech stack, well, we are working on our own fork of OpenShift and Kubernetes. And we've added a bunch of controllers. So each robot is now responsible for its own compute in a bulkheaded design. And uh, what this allows us to do is sort of scale in and scale out. And cloud computing does not mean providing an API to a bunch of machines. It actually means consuming compute storage and network orthogonally as required. And I think this is a key enable enablement required for robots to sort of succeed and for us to see them everywhere. And yeah, that's all I have to say. So look out on reputa.org. We'll probably open source components of a lot of these things. And we hope to push back to the community. And if you find this interesting, hit me up uh, and have a chat. Thank you. I've got a minute, so I am going to play a little video. Which sort of sums this up. Uh, there's no audio.
So basically, right now we are full stack, and our full stack extends to designing our own hardware, designing our own chips, designing our own devices, and also writing front end code, writing all of that in one piece. So, well, that's the vision. Imagine the potential of connecting these agile machines and giving them infinite computation and storage. Uh, thank you. Pratik? Anshu Pratik. Aha, here he comes. Um, you need to just sign this quick disclaimer. Mm -hmm. Also, if Sriram is here, maybe you can sign the form ahead of time. It's, yeah. Hey guys, uh, so someone, I think Aditya already talked about using Grafana functions, so it slightly builds on top of that. So essentially my problem was we had outages, right? Everyone has outages. When we go and look for the postmortem of the outages, yes, there was a graph, there was an alert, there was everything. Everything which was required to tell people that there's going to be an outage was there. But still, we would come to know about it in the postmortem. Yes, everything was there, but still we missed it. So the problem was there was too much noise. Okay, this is alerting, that is alerting, how do we get around it? Let's say we want to alert around latency. This is how the typical latency graph looks like, right? When it comes to monitoring, do, we, do I really care about whether it's one second, two millisecond, 200 millisecond, 900 millisecond? No. What I care about is what was it there in the last minute, five minutes ago, and what is it now? As long as it's same as where it was, let's say, a few minutes ago, I'm all fine. Be it one minute, be it 1500 min a minutes, I don't, I do not care. So what we did was, and then other thing that we, would, that we had to do is if you want to put monitoring, you essentially have to, let's say, especially in AWS, you have to uh, put a CloudWatch alert, alert or uh, whatever monitoring tool you have to put, you have to put on each and every specific resource. So that becomes time consuming. So what we did was we imported all of the data into Prometheus. Prometheus is a time series database, I think uh, we spoke about earlier today. Uh, so out here, this is, let's say, two specific pieces that we started off with. For my two uh, regions, I have the unhealthy host graph. So out here, it's like all zero. This is all zero. Th this was a deployment that was happening a few minutes back. So now this essentially filters out the noise. Uh, the moment there's anything non-zero, I know that I should alert. I should get an alert on that, and that sh I should action upon it. This is what I was talking about specifically in terms of latency. So this is how a tip, uh, the, we just saw like how the typical latency graph looks like, and this is my graph specifically for the alert basis. So here, if you look at it, everything is between zero and one. I have set my threshold to three. If anything goes above three, that's the only time I care about, okay, there's, there's an issue and it should alert. Other than that, as long as it's all fine, yeah, it's going up and down. Basically, the delta is going up and down. Last second, it was 200 millisecond. Right now, it's 190. Next second is 320. I don't really care about that as long as, you know, it's within the threshold. So this is what we, what we do now. Essentially, this is a delta function. So if we take a quick look at it. Uh, drop common labels so that removes the rest of the data that in Promisa that I don't care about. Delta function for all of my ELB latency alert. Here I have removed the other ELBs that I don't care about and I'm doing it over five minutes. So this is one way of doing it. The way it started off, uh, this is built on top of Prometheus. So let's say this is the same graph in Prometheus. Uh, uh, right now, the alerts are based on top of Grafana. Grafana 4. Point, uh, the latest Grafana basically has, you can put alerts over there. Earlier, it was not there when I started off. So this is way, like, you can put alerts either in Prometheus or in Grafana. Now we do it in Grafana. And let's talk about noise, right? So this is all the Grafana alerts that I get now. 
uh, from this system and if you look at the count essentially let's say May 3rd, May 4th every day the number of alerts if you see they are in single digits. Only like when there is any specific outage let's say this was the day I had 12 alerts and that let's say if you talk to any monitoring guy that is like pretty 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 less right otherwise we get like drowned in alerts. So yeah this is how it is. Uh, we are planning to expand this to further more things right now these are all the four basic alerts that takes care of covering most of my things on a higher level for rest other things we have more uh, rest of the monitoring still in place. This is just to ensure that my downtime is minimum. In fact with the help of this speci uh, especially with the latency alerts we are now able to avoid downtimes and outages because the moment any of them start spiking I know immediately something is going wrong and now we can act upon it even before the outage starts. So since the day that we put it about two weeks back, uh, the day we started putting this we actually caught one particular outage in progress while doing a deployment we were able to avoid it. So yeah that's how it is. Uh, what we are trending towards is uh, detecting these anomalies and preventing the outages rather than you know fixing the outages post mortem. So yeah that's what it is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next talk is by Sriram and it's entitled Restful Email. Okay, um, my colleagues actually just put my name on the board so I have to speak about it. Um, my name is Sriram, I work for Endurance and I'm not having any slides as such but you can go ahead and sign up on our platform Bluehost and we're launching a new product called restful.email. So basically we give you the developers the power to send emails where API calls track and get the quota as such and also uh, determine whether you have successfully the recipient has successfully opened the mail and uh, click through rates as such. And this is launching pretty soon. You can go ahead and explore the tool and I encourage all of you just to check out DevCloud and use it. And I think uh, DigitalOcean doesn't have this integration so that's like one of our selling points so just go ahead and check it out. Um, anything else you guys want to know? I can. I have questions because I think it's just like 50 seconds so that's it. <laughs> Okay, cool. Go check it out. Yeah, thanks. All right, the next talk is Nursery Rhymes, uh, as applies to DevOps, by Shakti. Check, check. Yeah, so the um, motivation is to use uh, nursery rhymes that everyone knows about to share DevOps experiences and best practices. Uh, so I've tried to put this together. Uh, I hope you enjoy that. Please read. Agreed? Let's begin. Jack and Jill went up to the server to run the test with Docker. Jack pushed code and broke his test and Jill never spoke to him thereafter. Tester, tester, have you any bugs? Yes sir, yes sir, three code dumps. One for my master, scrum. One for my lead. One for my manager who's a friend indeed. One little, two little, three little containers, four little, five little, six little containers, seven little, eight little, nine little containers. Oh, BSD has had jails forever. <laughs> Humpty Dumpty sat to debug. Humpty Dumpty squashed a bug. All the team members and stakeholders gave Humpty a big, tight hug. Goosey goosey DevOps sir, where shall I wander? GitHub or Bitbucket, decide on something sooner. Clone a project folder, code to make it better. See collaboration working closer and I shall be an eye opener. Twinkle twinkle unit test, how I wonder where you exist. 
I will write unit test until the project is laid to rest. <laughs> code, code, code your way gently down the screen. Come it early, come it often, and life is but a dream. See my little hands go hack, 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 and my little tests run back to back. I just have one word to say to you. Come learn DevOps and say I'm happy for you. One, two, pick your crew. Three, four, shut the door. Five, six, write your scripts. Seven, eight, test them straight. Nine, ten, make them your zen. Eleven, twelve, time to sell. Thirteen, fourteen, customers are keen. Fifteen, sixteen, customers are seen. 17, 18, repeat your routine. 19, 20, get paid a plenty. Project issues in the way, in the way, in the way. Project issues in the way, my fair user. Fixing bugs right away, right away, right away. Fixing bugs right away, my fair user. Merging PRs as I say, as I say, as I say. Merging PRs as I say, my fair user. All the tests are passing, hey, passing, hey, passing, hey. All the tests are passing, hey, my fair user. As a client, you should pay, you should pay, you should pay. As a client, you should pay, my fair user. DevOps are really save the day, save the day, save the day. DevOps are really save the day, my fair user. Last but not the least, when I say clap your hands, give me two claps, okay? If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you apply software patches, clap your hands. If you apply security updates, clap your hands. If you apply software patches and you apply security updates and your application still survives, clap your hands. If your package install worked, clap your hands. If your gem install worked, clap your hands. If your package install worked and your gem install worked and your npm install also worked, clap your hands. If your CI tool is running, clap your hands. If your code is compiling, clap your hands. If your CI tool is running and your bills are always passing, then you're happy and smiling, clap your hands. If you have a plan A, clap your hands. If you have a plan B, clap your hands. If you have a plan A and if you have a plan B and you always use plan C, clap your hands. If you notice the containers crash, clap your hands. If you build the containers from cache, clap your hands. If you fix them in a flash and you redeploy them in a bash and your manager didn't give a trash, clap your hands. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next talk we have is SSH Key Management with Python and Jenkins by Mehul. Aha, uh -huh. and can you just quickly sign it?
Hello. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I wanted to show on a small little script that I've written. Uh, one of the problem points that I usually face with, even though we are a small team, uh, managing the SSH keys was becoming a problem as as our inventory, the number of servers that we have started increasing. At times, people would change the SSH key, and we, we didn't really have updated uh, available all the time. Sharing of the SSH keys was becoming a problem. Uh, I tried to look for a quite a few scripts around which would allow me to update the SSH keys and manage them. I didn't find anything useful. So we, we had two requirements. One is the user should be up, able to upload the SSH key by themselves. And second would be that uh, we work with uh, uh, Rackspace Cloud and Google Cloud. And especially Google Cloud has some provisions in its API that you can update the SSH key to the API and that makes some of the things very simple. Uh, so what I did was uh, I just uh, sat down one evening and uh, wrote a simple Python script using a couple of uh, packages that are already available in Python. Uh, one is called uh, SSH pub keys. You just uh, give the pass the S, uh, your SSH key to this uh, library and it passes the SSH key and well, does uh, give you uh, it separates it out in a way that you can use it. So what I was doing is uh, take the SSH key from the user and first uh, take the username part and since I tied it with Jenkins, I was able to uh, validate if the person is uploading SSH key for their own name. So what we had was that you, uh, the username on the server, username in Jenkins and the email address for the user would always be the same. So whatever SSH key you uploaded would only be yours. So uh, those kind that validation was being done whenever a SSH key was being uploaded, and we used uh, I used a library called SSH Authorizer. Uh, basically, the library does it takes the list of hosts that you have and push, uh, pushes the uh, uh, the key that you pass to it to the given host. Uh, that gives you. Uh, and then f at first I thought how like I have the script how do I give it out to the user so first I thought about building a small web API for that but then I realized we already have Jenkins and I didn't want to build auth authorization layer uh, and that would be a lot of work to do so I realized we have Jenkins and Jenkins can handle this uh, all the users in our company have the ac all the developers have the access to Jenkins so I just wrote a Jenkins task where user can pass the SSH key that they have, it will be passed by the script and if everything validates correctly, it will be passed on to the server. And if it's uh, in case, the next step that I'm looking to do is to pass it on to Google Cloud using their uh, APIs so you can uh, basically, the good part about it is while the machine is running, you can replace the API key if you, even if you don't have the access to it. You just need the access to the APIs. So yeah, that would be it. Sorry, uh, it would make mo little more sense if I had shown you what I'm doing.